Good morning, everybody. This is episode nine of the Off Topical Podcast. My name is Gardner. And my name is Raven. And IBM announces their own Linux distro. It's called Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and they only paid $34 billion for it. Plus, System76 debuts their new desktop PC models. And will Electronic Arts embrace Linux gaming? All this and more today. But first, let's talk about ProtonDB. Did you hear about this? Oh, I did. Fantastic new name change, by the way. I don't have to really keep it bookmarked in order to find it. Yeah, there have been a couple times where I've been like on stream and uh, trying to tell people uh, to go to spcr.netlify.com, but I can't for the life of remember spcr <laughs> it, it, it kind of it felt like a non sequitur almost you know yeah it, it's a also the the website is a lot better now much much easier navigation there's a news section and it's it's awesome i really like it they actually cited the fact that they changed their name because nobody could remember spcr.netlify.com and uh so yeah and and with the with the migration to protondb.com they have upgraded their uh web design and there's a bunch of new features in fact um today as of recording this november 1st they actually announced that there's uh there's a new stats beta stats feature on their website which is really cool have you looked at that raven no i didn't even know they've uh even done that yeah, it's really cool. Um, they've released uh, the contents of their database under the Open Database Contents license, and uh, the stats page dives into a bunch of interesting metrics. Wow, that's crazy. It shows you how many uh, p entries met the minimum system requirements for the game versus didn't. Uh, it shows you the the reported Proton version, as well as a breakdown over you know GPU type, distro um display driver usage it's it's really fascinating stuff uh, i i'd highly recommend you guys go check that out if you haven't seen it already that is crazy how many people are using the really old version of the nvidia driver considering proton once you know 396 yeah i think it's specifically what 396.51 or something at a minimum yeah yeah but, I mean, now it's moved up to 5.4, so everybody's probably on 5.4. But, like, NVIDIA 384.130. Why on earth are you still using that driver? I, I mean, I feel like if you're using that driver, your reports shouldn't be counted. I've almost, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of understand why, but it's like because, because it uses DXVK, you're not really going to get that great of performance. And that version doesn't have Vulkan support. I don't think it does anyway, because that's a pretty old... I mean, that's an LTS version of the driver. Yeah. It's probably someone still running on, like, 1404 or 1604. Right. With, like, an older GPU. And there definitely are... Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't break down the uh, the uh, Ubuntu version that people are running out of the distros, but um, Ubuntu coming in at, at the top with 7,034 total reports uh, from Ubuntu, which is insane to me. And Ubuntu then, is the biggest uh, distro. Definitely. And then Mint and Arch are the next two, which is cool to me. Manjaro has been, like, has seen a huge increase in growth recently overall. If you look at, like, Google Reports or if you look at um, uh, Distro Watch or whatever, Manjaro is, like, one of the most, uh, it's one of the distros that has the most interest shown in it. And yet it's number five on this list. Um, which is just interesting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, if you guys haven't seen this, uh, I would recommend going over to uh, protondb.com, checking out the stats page. Uh, if you need help with, uh, with a game that you're trying to get running through Proton, there's also some great resources there for that. Um, if you have seen it, what do you think of ProtonDB? Let us know in the comments or send us an email, gardener at offtopical.net. All right, the PlayStation Classic Edition has announced the full lineup of games that are coming to the device. This is really exciting stuff if you're a classic PlayStation fan like I am. Oh, absolutely. Um, they, I knew Metal Gear Solid was going to be on there. I just, oh, yeah. No way I it mean, couldn't it, it be. has to be. I, I know, right? Like, you can't have the PlayStation 1 without Metal Gear Solid. I mean, that game just kind of launched and just exploded. 
Yeah, it did. Um, I'm buying it just for that. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I was a huge fan of Metal Gear Solid back in the day. Also a huge fan of Siphon Filter. Uh, did you ever play that? I did. You know, I, I didn't play it till like 2001 or something, 2002. I picked it up at a yard sale for like $3 and then ended up playing it for like an entire weekend. Wow. Yeah, I played it with uh, a bunch of my friends. Um, we would always like hang out at each other's houses and, you know, trade controllers to while we're playing the game it was oh, yeah, also, the good old couch multiplayer man yeah that's that's still how the only way i like to play multiplayer games is with someone sitting right next to me yep i love that taser <laughs> yeah me <laughs> like, too i was never forget never forget you get that taser and dude's way up high on the skyscraper you just tase him off of it on fire it's like okay and it's like the funniest thing about the taser is just i have this image in my head burned into it of like when I think siphon filter, that's what I see. Like the what's his name, Gabe? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So he's standing there right in the middle of the screen, and then all of a sudden, this bright white, like pixelated, uh, whatever you call it, like taser wire shoots out from the player, and it, and like into a black void because the draw distance was almost nothing. You know, <laughs> that yeah. was such a great game. Um, man, there's a bunch of cool games here too, like Rainbow Six. Twisted Metal. Now, I would have preferred Twisted Metal 3, but uh, Twisted Metal is still pretty cool. Wild Arms. Uh, I always like Twisted Metal 2. Twisted Metal 2 is uh, definitely probably my favorite for the PlayStation 1, anyway. Uh, see, Twisted Metal 3 had uh, the best uh, feel, I think, for the game. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it was. It was just. It was just really awesome. Um, it was like the first two, but it was all the stuff was ironed out. I guess maybe, you know, it was basically the same game, but it just kept being. Uh, I guess it just more refined. Yeah. Is the word. Yeah, definitely refined is the word I'm looking for. It also has Grand Theft Auto, which is not Grand Theft Auto Three. I think, I think people might be disappointed when they pick this up and it's not GTA Three. <laughs> Uh, I guess that is the version of Grand Theft Auto that most people remember, maybe. Yeah. GTA 3 is like the, the first, first 3D Grand Theft the, Auto. Exactly. And I think this GTA is going to like, I don't know if that's going to stand up to what people expect from GTA nowadays, you know? Well, f full 3D. Uh, I think technically Grand Theft Auto 1 and 2 uh, are somewhat 3D, like the buildings I think are 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The buildings but, are 3D, but like, you know, it's not like the, the third person camera kind of game. No, no, no. It's it does have some interesting aspects, like certain missions. Like if you know what you're doing, you can just run over the people who are gonna jump you. Just yeah, plow them right over and be like, get out of the car, go answer the telephone, get back in your car. You know, there was some great stuff. That that game was really, actually pretty hard. I I had a time with it. I'm also a little sad that, like, see, I I, I wouldn't really want like jumping flash especially or rayman not really the biggest rayman fan yeah i'm i'm sad to to not see uh silent bomber on this list silent bomber was one of my favorite games growing up it's a shame that command and conquer is not on this list honestly i mean yeah it wasn't the greatest uh well well you know rts is on consoles are a little iffy but yeah it, it was fully featured it had all the same stuff that you know the the original one had on for on computer except it was on playstation it wasn't too bad you know you just hold x and then you drag the little square and you move your units yeah all in all for controls it's not the worst rts that anyone's ever done supreme commander on uh console was pretty bad <laughs> see i think one of the problems with all of these uh you know classic edition consoles is the licensing is so jacked up now from i know when right it came out then like right you know did westwood port um their game or was it done by a third party no it was westwood it was westwood and now it's westwood is owned by electronic arts westwood i think they were owned exist. at electronic arts back then i think electronic arts bought them in 98 or something so i think they right. were already owned by electronic arts they were when the playstation then? version came out okay oh yeah westwood's owned been owned by electronic arts for way too damn dude. way too long that's so sadly. depressing i know right <laughs> uh but yeah I don't know. I thought this was a really interesting story. I'm really hoping that um, this, uh, the PlayStation Classic is running. Uh, oh, I Linux. can't wait to get it. Yeah. 
if an interesting thing is that these controllers are shipping they're the original like analog less controllers like they don't have analog sticks so i don't know why they would decide to do that you know and Ooh. well in fairness about half these games on this list came out before the analog controllers yeah but it, it also like precludes a lot of games like uh ape escape Ape Escape was yeah. one of my favorite games of all time. You had to have that stupid analog controller. I remember that because we had to buy a controller to play Ape Escape. <laughs> I remember my dad being pissed. He was like, what? And then, you know, went to Walmart and, like, looked around because, you know, it was holidays and, yeah. you know, had to buy a controller. Also, I don't know how on earth you play Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six without an analog stick. Dude, that game probably uses uh, the D-pad to, like, oh, look God, around. Don't. And the, <laughs> left and right is going to be look uh, left and right, and then the D pad uh, up is going to be move forward and <laughs> backward. You're going to use the right and left bumpers to strafe. It's going to be a good time. <laughs> oh. oh no! See, this is like, the cause... other problem that I have too. Like, if Nintendo comes out with the with the oft rumored uh, N64 Classic Edition, it, these games are just not going to hold up to today's gaming standards. You know, like. Classic, like the Super Nintendo and the NES Classic Editions, you know, they were like the refined versions of 2D gaming, you know? Like, there were a lot of consoles that came before them, and, and oh, yeah. all the bugs had been worked out, basically. So Plus, they were 2D. You don't need all that extra. Right. But, like, controller. These, this, uh, this console here and the N64 Classic Edition, if that uh, even comes out... I don't think that they're going to do as well, honestly, as the uh, SNES or NES Classic Editions. I don't know. I mean, they, they might. Um, if the N64 Classic comes out, I, I might get a couple of the controllers just because, dude, it's very hard to emulate N64 games. Even yeah, just, you need a controller. I know they sell them on Amazon. You buy like a USB one, but... Oh, man, because Nintendo is notorious for having the worst controllers. The N64 <laughs> started it, and they've never stopped. They have the worst controllers the ever, Game in Cube my opinion. The a great controller. Don't, don't, no, don't, <laughs> don't, no. I mean, it's better than the N64, but, like, what were they thinking with the N64? Honestly, what were they thinking with that there, thing? It was still, like, unknown territory, man. Like, you know, can't give them too much crap for it. In, in fairness, Sony got it right. You know what it might be? You huh. know what it honestly might be? They worked with Sony to build the PlayStation. Yeah. I'm not sure if you know that piece of history or not. And then they had a mm -hmm. falling out. And then Sony went off to make the PlayStation. Nintendo went off to make the N64. I guarantee you they probably came up with that crazy controller because they couldn't do the one that Sony had because Sony owned it. Mm. So, you know, they had to come up with this crazy thing. I mean, now it's all kind of standard. Either that or it's just, you know, because there were some games that were kind of designed for Nintendo's crazy little controller. I mean, because you could play some of those games with one hand. Right, and you could play, like, the, uh, you know, N64, uh, what was it? Perfect Dark and GoldenEye with two controllers, one in each hand. <laughs> um, yeah, that was I remember cool. that. That was great. See, if there's an N64 Classic, I'm totally going to buy it just for GoldenEye because I know it's going to have GoldenEye on it. It, it does, won't. Cry. There's no way it will have GoldenEye. Not a it, single it, it chance. Should. It Technically, should. Technically, Nintendo it still owns it. No. It should. It better have GoldenEye on it. Activision it has the Dark rights for James Bond games, and uh, Rare has the right to, to the actual game. So and It'll, 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 it'll probably still come on it. I really doubt it, dude. I hope oh, we'll, it does. We'll see. We'll see if it comes out. Also, Gauntlet. Oh, dude, can you imagine if it has Gauntlet? Oh, I'm getting so excited now. I don't think I've played Gauntlet. You've never played Gauntlet? No, what is it? It's it's kind of like a really... Well, it's an arcade game that they brought to the N64 and later the Dreamcast and then even later the PlayStation 2 and so on and so on. Um, I'll send you a video of it later. It's, it's actually a whole lot of fun. It's a great couch game. It's fantastic. Nice. And nice. it's brutal. And people die and... You lose friendships, it's great. Nice. What games do you want to see on the PlayStation Classic? Uh, they've already announced all the games, so what are you sad to not have? Uh, what games did you want to see on this? Let us know uh, in the comments or send us an email. Or hit us up on Twitter. I'm at the Linux Gamer on Twitter, and he is Raven67854 on Twitter. 
Electronic Arts is working on a prototype engine called Halcyon, and it has Linux and Vulkan support. Did you hear about this one, Raven? I did. I didn't know that it, I mean, they just recently announced the Linux support, but I remember when they announced it, what was it, last year, I think? Mm. Um, they they showed off like a pretty decent tech demo and talked about how fast the artists made it. Because this engine is, um, it's, a, it's a prototype bed for stuff that will probably later be made with or turned into new features for Frostbite. Yeah. And it's supposed to be, you know, rapid prototyping, really flexible and you know very next gen i'm I think in certain aspects it's even ahead of frostbite but you know right well one of the uh interesting things at a talk that they gave at the chronos uh summit was it, is that what that is the chronos summit the the one in munich yeah. yeah they uh they announced that the uh halcyon engine has linux and mac os support and it supports uh vulcan and metal um which is awesome and and it's surprising to hear that coming from electronic EA. arts of anyone you know right it, crazy the thing is though it's not like a production game engine like you said i mean this is meant to be like something that they can really quickly like prototype a game in and see, you know see how uh, much work it might be in in their proprietary their other proprietary engine that a lot of their games seem to use now which is what's it called frostbite yeah frostbite Great name. Shame they own it. Yeah, um, for real. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, Frostbite, uh, what was it? It was at one of their GDC talks a couple years ago. They talked about how it takes them, like, over a week to set up Frostbite for production, which is insane to yeah, me. Yeah, that's crazy. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure they have, like, a whole bunch of, like, uh, you know, they probably have their own um, method for sharing source and assets. And I'm sure there's a lot of servers and other stuff they have to set up, you know, and it's not like they're just like, Oh, just download it and run the installer. You know, I mean, how many machines do they probably have that they have to put it on? Yeah. Stuff takes time. Um, and it probably also takes even more time when they want to update. So this little thing is at least from what I've gathered from what they've said, it's really small. They just put it on the machine and then the artist can just go to town with it. And I'm sure a lot of these new features, like I, I, I'm sure they don't like the fact that Frostbite takes time to deploy. Right. I'm sure like once Frostbite's set up, I'm sure it's very quick. It's just that initial setup. So this kind of does that away. They can prototype it. If the idea is great, then they roll in the big boy and then they, they build a title that maybe someone will buy if they like Origin. Right. And this is right. Like this is more like an in-house uh unreal or unity engine type deal right like this is not this is not meant for external use like unity or uh unreal is but it's it's meant for in-house development of games really quickly um but like some of the renders that i saw look you know really good like on par with frostbite you know oh absolutely i mean it's it's not a slouch um but yeah, like you said, it's it's in house only. Uh, Origin or EA, I guess depending on how you want to look at it, does have the indie developer platform or whatever it is they call it. I don't know. Not too many people use it because you know Origin. Right. Um, it really is just a store for EA at this point. Um, but you can't put your indie title on it. I'm sure that you know if you had a probably had a title on there already and you know it already worked with them. I'm sure like I could see them in the future like if your game is being published by EA that they might let you use it. Yeah. Like probably. frostbite or halcyon, which would be cool. I mean, you know, I, I would like to see this actually like even become freeware, like, yeah. not open source, but even become freeware. Cause it would just be nice to have something to shake the monopoly of unreal and unity. Yeah. I know Godot is slowly growing, but there's always enough room for one more competitor. Right, and another engine that targets Linux natively. like Oh, absolutely. Like, where's Source? I mean, Source 2. Yeah. I mean, remember two years ago, Valve announced that Source 2 at GDC was going to be free for everyone, and it was going to have a full production suite for Windows, Mac, and Linux. <laughs> Where is it? I. It's like, what, late 2018 now, and yeah. it's still not here? And now we have EA, of all people, EA. Yeah, uh, we have a full engine that's just product well quote unquote production ready and it runs on linux and it has vulcan support and it's like where'd you come from yeah it, it's i mean i don't think gabe was wrong when he said that uh, linux is the future of gaming and just like just the fact that electronic arts is working in-house 
on Linux and Vulkan, like that makes me super duper excited for the future of Linux gaming. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, there's no way EA is sitting there and not seeing what Microsoft is doing and like, we need no. to do something about it. Yeah. Because you know, they already have it on Mac. Yeah. You know, because of the Sims and all this other, uh, the Sims, I don't actually know what else <laughs> they have. SimCity? Um, yeah. But the, or I believe they do have Origin on Mac because of that. And you know, EA is a big company. They like money like anyone like anyone else. And over there, looking across their little lake, they see Valve just tinkering away on Linux, collecting money that could also be theirs. There's no way they're just going to sit by and not consider it. No. Definitely. Now, whether or not they do it is totally different. But Yeah, I, I, think, I think that this will be, uh, you know, this might be a tipping point that we need for sure um oh if if ea drops uh origin for linux that would be a hell of a tipping point yeah i mean i can't tell you how many people i've heard in the comments say like man i just wish that like mass effect was on linux you know and it's like that's not a game i am interested in playing anymore but like you know a lot of people are and uh if that came to linux that would be huge that would be amazing oh that would be amazing It'd be like Bethesda announcing Fallout for Linux. Yeah. Yeah. Or Epic, like Fortnite, you know? I, I swear that's coming at some point. It has to it be. It has to. They have their, their engine supports it. Yeah, and they have... I don't think they use Easy Cheat or... Not Easy Cheat. What is it? Battle Eye or anything. Maybe they use Battle Eye? I can't remember. I don't know. Um, but, the, you know, they have... They have the, they definitely have the resources. And the engine already works on Linux. But that would require them to port the launcher. Which is something that Linux people who use Unreal have been wanting for a while now. Just, you know, give us the launcher and start putting out a, you know, a supported version on Linux. Because it really has reached maturity. Yeah. I mean, you don't have the other tools that you may or may not need. But the engine itself has reached a fairly decent maturity. Right. I remember a while Thanks ago. Thanks to the Linux community. Yeah. So uh, a while ago, I tried to use uh, Unreal Tournament there which what the hell happened to that by the way <laughs> um uh fortnite started making a ton of money and then they forgot about everything else that's what happened to that right yeah uh but i had to like follow all these like arcane instructions on how to like get the game running because they were like uh launcher support should be coming in the next couple months and it never showed up so i don't know nope I, i'd i'd really like to see uh electronic arts embrace linux oh, but what do you guys think um would that signify the end of linux for you because it's too uh too triple a at that point what do you guys think let us know you can hit us up on twitter at the linux gamer at raven eight, uh, 67854 or uh send us an email gardener at off System76 releases their Made in America PC lineup, Filio. This is super exciting stuff, man. I, I did know, you see right? any of this? Oh my god. Oh, I know. I, I, I actually really like the fact it's Made in America. Me too, man. It's really nice that they actually, because uh, did you see, uh, what's his name? I f always forget the CEO's name. Carl Richel. I don't always forget that. I don't know. I don't know either. Anyway, I'm sorry, Carl, if you uh, listen to this podcast. He had like a, I think it was a Medium or maybe it was a System76 uh, blog post. I think it was the other day, like explaining their purpose for Thelio. Yeah. And how he wants to bring back electronic manufacturing to the U.S. And he really raises a good point. Outside of bringing back manufacturing jobs and, you know, all the other good stuff that comes with, you know, building a business. Um, it is so much more better for the environment to just produce some of these things locally. Yeah. Because, you know, putting them on massive cargo containers that, you know, just down hundreds of gallons of you know raw oil to get them across the ocean it's not very it's not very environmentally friendly no by comparison and also i really love the fact that uh every time you buy one they plant a tree that's just fantastic it's really cool um i do need to tell everybody that like full disclosure i actually went to system six seven to system 76's headquarters out in denver when they were showing off prototypes to the press and this was like two years ago, but just so you guys know, there might be a little bit of bias in this just because System76 is cool and like I know them and everything. So, Well, I, I have tons of System76 laptops. Actually, all of my, I guess you want to say more modern, actually, no, 
all my modern laptops are system 76 that's awesome yeah i have i think i've had a sorry oh i have a system 76 laptop as well it's great right yeah it's fantastic yeah it's 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 like the greatest thing ever it's it's absolutely fantastic mostly because it just comes with linux and the lovely ubuntu key seriously i i love that ubuntu key not seeing a windows key is like the greatest thing ever yeah oh yeah that's it's super cool so I don't want to harp too much on the fact that I saw the prototypes, but there were a couple things in the prototypes that aren't in this. And I wanted to like just talk about it really quick with, with you because uh, I, I really like the design that they have right now. It's really great. And it's way better than the prototype design. But there are a couple things that I really just want to talk about really quick. Uh, one of the things is that um, the prototype model had like a star field etched into uh the side of the case and it was backlit and it was like a star field of what looked like what the sky would have looked like in denver colorado at the beginning of the unix epoch that's pretty cool that's really awesome um and the other thing was that like the the case was like invertible so you could turn it upside down and you would be able to have the 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 um Oh, I guess I guess like the the design of the thing was like more trapezoid and less rectangular. So like one ang- one side of the case was actually angled at like maybe a thirty degree angle, rather than having it be like you know parallel with the other side. So you would be able to flip the case over so that the angled side would be facing towards you. Huh. Which that was I mean that was just a prototype. But I mean those are the two things that I I was like where did those go? <laughs> But it's probably a, too expensive or inflated their costs or just or didn't like, fit with their design. Yeah, and airflow was an issue probably with flipping it around. Um, the star, the star thing seems pretty cool. Uh, but I'm, you know, uh, we talked about this like before. Well, actually, we've been talking about the System Seventy Six thing all day. Um, yeah. But I, I like the the wood a little bit. I'm not. I, I'm I'm kind of iffy on the the wood paneling. Yeah. Well, it's not even wood paneling. It looks like a solid block of wood, actually. Um, it's real wood, as far as I know. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it is real wood. It is it is a solid block of wood, which, you know, that adds a fair bit of weight, but whatever. Um, but I actually really like the fact that it doesn't have a glass side. I hate RGB keyboards and glass side yeah. and then neon glowing anything. I hate that stuff. And maybe I'm in a minority when it comes to that, but I don't like it. I don't think it looks that great. I'm not a huge fan of, like, RGB lighting at all, Um, but I do like being able to see into my case. Really? So, you know, there's a trade-off, yeah. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it it definitely looks really slick. If you guys haven't seen it yet for some strange reason, um, because, I mean, their website, like, imploded. Yeah, it did. It, it, like, was not available for several hours today. Yeah, but it looks fantastic. And and the best part, you remember last week we were just talking about, you know, why does System76 hate AMD? Hey, guess what? They don't hate AMD. Right. Because now the Thelio and the Thelio Major, you can get AMD CPU or an AMD GPU. Yeah, and that's really exciting stuff. I am I had a suspicion that they would be uh, revealing that they'd have AMD parts in this because yeah. there's just no reason not to. Yeah, I understand it for laptops because, you know, AMD just doesn't have a solution for laptops, unfortunately. Yeah. But there was no reason whatsoever for their desktop. And now I'm really, really glad to see that it, uh, we finally have a complete AMD solution. Yeah, which is for sure. Awesome. Plus, the, uh, they have that, uh, they have some, they're starting to build their own components in it. I didn't look too much into that, so I don't really uh, know enough about it yet. But it looks pretty co- uh, cool for helping control. Um, what temperature and the processor and some other stuff. Yeah, a uh, backplate for uh, mounting hard drives and everything too. So, you know, SATA, SATA drives and everything. It's pretty awesome. They uh, uh, Some of the cool features though, like uh, materials for the case are sourced in the United States and the machine is mac- manufactured and assembled in Colorado, which is rad. And... Uh, which and also, by the way, I wrote in in the notes here. Their Thelio beats the pants off of the Mac Mini and the Mac Pro in price and specification, even though Apple makes their crap in China, and this is manufactured here. Like, come on, man, come on. Yeah, you got to pay that premium to get that 
lovely little uh, apple that's going to break in like a year or two. Yeah. Uh, it's. Oh, absolutely. I really want one. Yeah. I would definitely get one if I literally hadn't just built Dargo. <laughs> <laughs> if you just literally hadn't. Yeah. Well. I mean, I spent. I just dropped 600 bucks on my graphics card, so. I don't know. Maybe you can ask and be like, hey, can I get one, but, like, not get the graphics card? <laughs> hey, you if know, you guys you... want to, like, uh, have me review it, I'll totally review it on the channel. Uh, I... you, you know you know what? They need to sell their case, just their case. Oh, my God, yeah. Because I would buy their case, I'd actually. buy their case if it was, like, I'd even buy it for, like, at a really ridiculous price, man. It, like, their case is so nice. Yeah, Absolutely. It looks very sturdy. I mean, I have a really nice Cool Master full tower, um, so I don't I don't know if their case would have enough for all my hard drives and everything. Maybe yeah. if I got the massive, but I don't know if that has a ATX board. Um, but uh, I would I would I would totally replace this Cool Master with that case. Yeah, it just looks nice. It looks easy to clean. You know, like my Cool Master, for example, it has like these uh, like this little tray on the top right next to the you know giant fan port and you know I, I like right now i have like my keys and a bunch of usb drives in it which is nice yeah but dust settles in there oh really yeah i hate it because i have to take everything out every once in a while and just spray it out and you know clean it and i just I, I don't like the fact that dust settles in there it also has like a bunch of like really fancy like designs that are like you know like grooves that are like built in and they go around the whole case I mean, it looks cool don't get me wrong but dust settles in there and it drives me nuts because i don't like dust damn dude see i have the, I, I have the fractal design define r6 and uh that case has like filtering and everything so like there's hardly any dust in my machine at all oh no i don't have any in the machine i'm talking about on the outside oh like these are like designs on the outside to look really cool and they oh. do look cool but dust settles in them. No, I have uh, this this uh, this case for almost every fan came with a mesh filter, which is amazing. By the way, yeah. if you don't have a if you don't have a case with a mesh filter, buy one because or, or you can just buy the filters. I, I bought a couple um, because I can't for the other fans because I can't I can't stand not having that little mesh guard. I mean, dust still gets in there, but not nearly as bad. Well, we like to know what you guys think of Thelio. Uh, which version of the Thelio do you want? The Thelio, the Major, or the Massive? Uh, let us know. Uh, you can hit us up in email form, gardener at offtopical.net, or you can hit us up on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Mastodon as well, at the Linux Gamer. Um, yeah, let us know what you think about this. Is this something you're interested in? Are you uh, proud of System76 for their accomplishment in manufacturing these devices? Let us know. Okay, biggest story. Lots of people are talking about it. IBM uh, is acquiring Red Hat. What do you yeah. think about this, Raven? Honestly, honestly, I don't care. Honestly, I, I, yeah, completely honest. And the reason for that is, I just don't personally use anything from Red Hat. I know Red Hat contributes a lot to Linux. I mean, yeah. a lot. But at this point, in this stage of the Linux, like Linux, the foundation of Linux is pretty stable. And I don't think IBM's going to suddenly turn around and like, you know, just to say, no, we're going to keep all of Red Hat's Linux stuff to our, they're not going to do that. So yeah. I, it, it's, it's a great deal for anyone who has any shares in Red Hat. And it seems to be a great deal for IBM. Yeah. I mean, Red Hat was, you know, Red Hat actually makes money. So buying a company that makes money is usually a good thing. Yeah. See, I think they overpaid for it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I don't think Red Hat's worth $34 billion. Right. But I would love to own some Red Hat shares. So, yeah, for sure. The, so the thing is, I just looked it up. Uh, according to the Linux Foundation, Red Hat contributed 8,987 changes to the Linux kernel that equals about 8% of all the changes to the Linux kernel and IBM added 2,995 changes, which equates to about 2.7% of total changes. Um, 
And that's from a uh, report in August of 2016. So Linux, so this would put Red Hat as really close to number one. Uh, I mean, IBM now, this would put IBM at the top of the list, or I guess not, because Intel contributed 14,000 changes. But still, I mean, that puts them really close to the top of the list there. And I don't, I don't really foresee this being like, yeah. You know, I know, I know some people like when it was announced and it was on Twitter and I sent it to you and you were like, oh my god, I know, I saw it. Yeah. And you know they were talking about Doomsday because you know OpenSUSE is being bought by um, Equity Partners or whatever. Yeah, some hedge fund group yeah. it looked like. Now that's more concerning. But IBM has a stake in supercomputers and all this other stuff. Right. So IBM is not going to go, you know. They're not going to screw it up because then they'll just they'll lose everything. So I, I don't actually foresee this as being a bad thing, but I don't know why they bought them. Like, no, you could just use Red Hat stuff. It's open source. So, yeah, why would you buy them? Like, it, it did not make a whole lot of sense because remember, Red Hat makes all of its money through uh, support. Yeah. So it's like you can just use Red Hat for free. Right. It's not like IBM's, you know, so hard off for cash, apparently. You know, they can afford their own talented Red Hat employees. So to me, I don't understand why they did it. I'm sure that it made sense to them, which is why they did it. And yeah, see, the thing is, Red Hat isn't just Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And it's not, you know, not just Fedora. I mean, Fedora is a community project. So it's like I went actually onto their website, redhat.com, and I looked at what their products are, like what they have listed here. And a lot of it is like cloud infrastructure and um you know, virtualization suites and stuff like that. You know, I don't use uh, Red Hat for anything. Like, I don't use any of their products or anything like that. But um, the fact that, like, the word cloud was mentioned 50 times in their press release uh, shows that, like, they're not, they don't really care that much about the Linux side. They care way more about the cloud. Uh, yeah, but that's all powered by Linux, which... Again, is another reason why I don't think they're going to screw it up. Right. No, and I mean, I don't think they're going to screw it up. Like, the problem that I have with it is that they're such, they're, they're, they're dinosaurs. Like, they, I mean, I don't know. They use the term cloud in contexts where it didn't read to me as it made sense or that they knew what they were talking about. Like, it just seemed completely jargony. It's just buzzwords. It's just, just buzzwords. buzzwords. And it's like, yeah. I don't know. Here's an example. Like companies today, this is a quote from their press release. Companies today are already using multiple clouds. However, research shows that uh, 80% of business workloads have yet to move to the cloud, held back by the proprietary nature of today's cloud market. Unquote. In other news, multifaceted clouds using the patented open IBM Red Hat cloud data cloud backup and cloud storage system make for an overcast day indeed. I mean, like it just literally doesn't make sense. I don't understand where this is coming from here. Maybe they're trying to make a push in the same way that because remember, you know, as you said, IBM's a dinosaur at this point. Yeah. You know, the only reason IBM is probably still trucking is the supercomputers and the absurd amount of patents that they keep churning out that yeah. just keep them afloat. Um. Because, you know, IBM used to be a home brand, you know. Oh, yeah. I have an a IBM Aptiva right here behind me. I, I love that little thing. So my guess is, is that they want to enter in the same space that Amazon and Google are in. And that is, you know, like Amazon, you know, has the AWS, for example, and all the crap that goes along with that. My guess is, is that they want to enter it and buying Red Hat was the cheapest and fast. Because remember, if. I guess you would have to pay for the Red Hat cloud stuff, probably. Maybe, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe not. I'm not really sure. You probably do now, but I don't know. So my guess is buying Red Hat was the cheapest way to get a solid foundation and ensure that no one else could buy it and then steal it from them. Yeah. You know, like, you know, they build their whole entire cloud infrastructure, you know, and then some competitor comes along and it's like, well, we can't dethrone them, so we're just going to buy the operating system they use and then charge them and then get a huge chunk of it okay i can see that maybe it was a preemptive thing or maybe it was just a really bad business choice for them who knows i guess it was just one of those things we're just gonna have to wait until it plays out and see the problem that i have is that like the only way that like these big companies like microsoft and ibm f can keep relevant you know is by buying like these smaller companies 
but then they just end up suffocating them, you know? And like, they're not innovative anymore. Like, that's the problem that I have with this. It's like, uh, like what Microsoft did with Skype. Yeah. Like Microsoft did with Skype, like electronic arts did with Westwood and Maxis and all these other companies. Uh, it's like, I just don't, they're dinosaurs and corporations by their very nature are averse to risk and don't take chances. And, you know, and I mean, I'm not saying that Red Hat isn't a corporation. I'm just saying like that Linuxy open source things in this world are great. And the less we have of them, the worse off we are. I don't like the idea of companies buying each other. I just don't. I don't think it makes any sense. It does from a business standpoint. It doesn't always end badly. I guess, no, it doesn't, you know, but... the problem is, is when it ends badly, everybody knows about it. Yeah. Because, you know, it screws with everything. And also, too, you know, we happen to live in a world where, you know, these are all tech companies. And when they buy stuff, it's like an immediate notice. You know, we, we noticed when Skype bought, or sorry, when Microsoft bought Skype, we noticed the downfall of it because we could see the old versions and then we could see this disgusting new version and then we just saw it get worse and worse and worse and worse. And then it, yeah, we've all seen the latest version of Skype. Uh, is, you know, Cortana is constantly popping up. The Clippy of 2018. <laughs> I know, right? But I don't think, I, I think in this one particular instance, I don't think it's going to affect anything at all. In fact, it might actually be better because... Well, it might not be better for desktop Linux, but server side and networking and all, this could potentially really boost Linux further. I mean, it could definitely. Um, but the thing is too, it's like over the last several years, like um, Ubuntu has grown in the, in the Linux, like for servers and cloud computing space and, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux has seen a decline, you know, in terms of like growth numbers. I like what Mark Shuttleworth said, where he said uh, the decline in Red Hat Enterprise Linux growth contrasted with the acceleration of Linux uh, more broadly is a strong market indicator of the next wave of open source. So he thinks like that this purchase is good for Canonical and good for Ubuntu because, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know. I think we end up with uh, a situation where the, the dinosaur removed a player and they're going to be going off and doing their own thing with the cloud services that, you know, they acquired from uh, Red Hat. And they're not, I don't know if they're going to be competing in the same space that Ubuntu's in anymore. Like Ubuntu's for smaller, more agile companies where, you know, IBM is for like the big business you know? Oh, yeah. Well, see, well, well what you're going to see is, is because, you know, IBM builds supercomputers. Right. You know, um, so what you're probably going to see is, you know, IBM building a supercomputer and it's going to run IBM Red Hat, you know, Enterprise Linux. Whew, that is a heck of a name to say. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's hard to say. I mean, I don't know. I mean, they might start announcing like streaming services, something like Dropbox you know, all built on their big giant infrastructure. I could see that. It's it's hard to say. I mean, there were a ton of people who like tweeted at me about this and were like, "What do you think?" I mean, I like two of our <laughs> two of our listener comments today are about this. But like, I don't know. I hope that Canonical stays independent right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Canonical is clearly setting themselves up to be sold. Uh, we've yeah. seen that in the past two years where they've they've trimmed the fat and, you know, they killed, you know, Unity 8 and Mirror and all this other stuff. And I seriously firmly believe that it was to trim the fat and make themselves more sellable. Um, yeah. But that's just that's my personal opinion on it. You know, I could be wrong because, you know, in fairness to Mark Shuttleworth, Ubuntu has never really made money and he has still pumped money into it. So, you know, and it's been how many years now? Like 15 years? Yeah. So it's it's hard to say. It could just be that, you know, Ubuntu was like, well, we're not going to make money this way. We do need to make money. So, you know, we're just going to start focusing on Internet of Thing devices and servers and whatnot. And we'll make money and the desktop will still. That's why they merged, you know, Ubuntu and Ubuntu GNOME together to pool resources. Yeah. 
So, I don't know. I guess we'll see where it all goes. I, I'm like you. I hope Canonical doesn't get bought. But on the other hand, as he put it, that might be a good thing. Because yeah. we might see a new distro appear that just takes us all by storm that doesn't have stupid stuff in it. That'd be nice. Like snaps or flat packs. Oh my god, snaps piss me off so hard right now. <laughs> uh, anyway... Uh, what do you guys think about this story? Like, uh, do you find it uh, in- exciting, scary, or does it give you hope for the future, or all of the above? Uh, let us know. We're uh, at the Linux Gamer on Twitter. He's Raven six seven eight five four on Twitter, and uh, yeah, let us know what you think. This is fascinating and scary time for the Linux world. Do you think we have time for some listener comments, Raven? Oh, absolutely. We have Julian here on Twitter, and he asks, Do you think IBM acquiring Red Hat will affect Fedora? Thoughts? Nope. No. I, I don't think it'll affect Fedora at all. Um, maybe a little bit at first, you know, especially if they pull any funding that Fedora may or may not be getting, assuming they even do that to begin with, Yeah. Um, which I don't think they would. Uh because Fedora is kind of a test bed for a lot of stuff anyway. Why would you kill your test bed? Right. Um, and also, too, Fedora is open source under an open source license. There's no way to kill it. It'll live on forever. There are a couple ways I could see IBM influencing Fedora. But, like, I really don't see it being, like, that big of an issue, you know? Like, I could see them maybe asking them to, like, change their name or something like IBM Fedora or something. I don't know why they would do that, but <laughs> that just seems like something that a clueless freaking business would do, you know? Yeah. I mean, they don't really even have a right to do that, but still, it's like, uh, I don't know. I can just see that. But Fedora's open source, and it's completely open source licensed from top to bottom. There's no way to really affect it, in my opinion. Yeah. Anything that they do, the community will just come in, patch, fix, improve, and then it'll be like it never happened. That's just, you know. Yeah. My opinion on that. Yeah, I I agree with you. Uh, Daniel also asks, is Canonical next? And we talked about this a little bit. Um, Personally, as an eternal optimist, I don't think so. I've heard a lot of people say that they think uh, Microsoft is going to swoop in and try and buy Canonical. But like, I read what Mark Shuttleworth said, and it kind of gives me hope that he is at a point now where he's like, wait, maybe I don't need to sell. Maybe this is a great, great moment for us. And we can really capitalize on this. If canonical is next, I would imagine it would be quite a ways off. Uh, because didn't Microsoft just buy someone GitHub? Ah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. I don't use GitHub. Yeah. And definitely not anymore. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I mean, Microsoft doesn't... I don't think they would have enough money to buy Canonical, honestly. I think they'd get it for a decent... Pr- I, like Either that or they'd get it for just a very low few billion, but considering what GitHub went for and what, considering what Red Hat went for, I could see Canonical going for, you know, at least 10 to 12 billion. That's, that's what I'm thinking. 10 to 12 billion for a Canonical. I don't see Microsoft having enough cash flow to do that. Maybe if they pump out and use stocks to do it, but I don't foresee it happening. I mean, there's other companies out there that could do it. Apple could afford to do it. Wouldn't that be a crazy thing? Uh, <laughs> Apple buys, at, wake up in the morning, Apple announces that they've bought Ubuntu. The whole world would be like, what, why? Yeah, like that doesn't fit your design language. <laughs> no, you know, um, who else could do it? Uh, Google? Oracle. Oracle, oh God, please don't. Amazon. Mm, Amazon could buy them. Uh, honestly, in my opinion, I could totally see uh, Google or Amazon buying Canonical. I can't see Google doing it. I can't see Google doing it. Yeah, but they could afford it. Oh, that's yeah, the, yeah, that's the big it. key thing. You know, you actually have to be able to afford it. There's not many players. You know, they, you know, less players the number of fingers you have that could actually afford to do it. At least, you know, in Western society. Yeah. You know. A Chinese company could buy them. What if Tencent, it was a Chinese example. company, dude? What if a Chinese company bought Canonical? I would never use Ubuntu ever again. Huawei. Huawei comes in, buys Canonical. What yeah. happens then? I don't know. <laughs> we have to audit the code every single time? <laughs> yeah, compile it yourself. 
Yeah. Oh my god. That would be just terrifying. No. Please, Mark, don't do that ever. Uh, you know, Tencent owns like 30% of Epic Games. Yeah. That's scary too, man. Yeah, it's like, no thank you. Because they do some pretty not so great stuff over there. Not here, but over there. But that's the whole point. There's there's rules here. Yeah. Uh, man, I'm getting like shivers and goosebumps just thinking about this. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, in some ways, I kind of wish I lived in the days when you, uh, like, Linux was young. Yeah. Like, real young. Like, back when it was like, great, my system crashed, you know? Do I go yeah. back to Windows 98 or DOS now, or do I just try it, you know? Because those days seemed a lot more, I guess, carefree for Linux. People were, I guess as Mark Shuttleworth said, people were, it was a wave of open source. Like, people were just trying new things, whether they succeeded or failed. And, you know, Red Hat was one of the greatest successes of that. Yeah, uh, Red Hat is, or I guess was now, the most, like, successful and profitable linux or open source company in the world right and like yeah. they the fact that like they're gonna be owned by a company that isn't dedicated to open source that just kind of makes me sad yeah i don't know and linux already had great like you know power pc support so like it's not like we're gonna benefit from like a huge patch that like massively improves you know performance on power pc architecture because you right. know how many supercomputers are powered by linux all of them yeah or i believe it's all of them actually one or two might go on unix but for the most part i believe like what 98 percent of them are all linux at least 98 yeah. percent they actually they might all be linux i'm not sure but the point is you know we already have really great support for that sort of stuff so it's not like we're going to get any advantage on that end either i don't know it's just kind of sad to me yeah but to answer daniel's question in a very short you know concise answer no they're not gonna they're not next not in the next two years and not anytime soon not anytime soon actually you know what you're right uh, let me change that not anytime soon but they are probably going to be next i could i i do see with, within the next decade or so canonical being bought yeah i hope not though All right, uh, next question from Nasif on Twitter. How did you discover Linux and what made you like it? That's a good question. Uh, you go first, Raven. Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, I can oh, go first if okay. you want. Okay, no, uh, it's okay. All <laughs> right. So I think I've mentioned this in a couple podcasts now uh, about my first early experiences with um, Linux. So uh, what happened was, you know, it was got to go way back to 2003 way back to 2003 and uh you know 13 years old didn't have a lot of money couldn't afford windows uh and we had this like terrible machine that was built in like 98 or so 99 and uh i mean it has an s3 trio uh graphics card which is like this four megabyte piece of junk oh that has a bga God. output i had one of those yeah too. it was it was terrible when it was new not not the machine but the graphics card yeah um so it couldn't do anything so that's to give you an idea of like what i had and my uncle gave me a book that had red hat linux on it and like how to set it up and how to use it you know back when like nice. you'd buy the book but like the the operating system was free but the book wasn't yeah and then he gave me a stack of CDs, which had different versions of Linux on it. One of them being Red Hat, one of them being Mandriva or Mandrake. I can't remember which one. They're both by the same company, but one of them was the open source version, and one of them was like the enterprise version. Yeah. And they don't exist anymore, by the way. And it's been way too long, and I don't remember. So it was one of those. And I, there were some others in there, like some others. And I literally like used the book to try to figure out and how to install it on my computer. So I'm like 13 years old and I'm trying to get it on my computer and it took like seven hours to get it on there just to load up to the screen and then it crashed and then I went to bed and then I woke up the next morning and finally I got everything working. Nice. Yeah, it was great. It was, it was a horrible experience. 
Um, and that was that was my first first. That's how I discovered Linux. What made me like it uh, was Ubuntu. Yeah. <laughs> Which you know I got Ubuntu the next year. Yeah. And it was definitely Ubuntu that made me like Linux. Um, because I used it, but I didn't like it. But it was either okay. use Linux or have a piece of metal that just sits on your desk. Right. So Ubuntu, because my experience with all of those versions was a nightmare. Ubuntu was put the disk in, push it in, run the installer, fill out all the info, and then it just booted. Like, you should have seen my face when it booted <laughs> on that machine. I was so happy. I was like, oh, my gosh, it works. It works. You know, I was, like, really excited. It, it found my modem I could dial in and connect to the Internet. It was crazy. Yeah. That was, like, man, I remember those days. <laughs> it was so much fun. Like, when I when I first started using Linux, um, I actually used Fedora 6 um, as my first distro. And it uh, was not my favorite experience. It took me a long time to figure out how to use MP3s. <laughs> um, like, a long time. I ended up, like, finding an application that would actually convert my MP3s to FLAC. Uh, as like a workaround, that was interesting. I ran out of disk space. <laughs> That's how like, really? long ago it was. Yeah, I had a tiny hard drive. Um, I had a forty gigabyte hard drive. Yeah, I had something to let, like that too. I had a I had like a two a hundred and twenty gigabyte external hard drive, and it was like big and fat and slow, and it sucks. And I think I still have it over there somewhere. Um, but yeah, man, I just remember like installing that and being like, wow, everything's so different. What is this rhythm box? Rhythm box was like a really cool thing for me back then. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, what else did I, it had, I was running like GNOME 2, some version of GNOME 2. And then um, I ended up going back to Windows for a little while um, because I just, it wasn't my... For, there was something wrong with Fedora. I just didn't care for it that much. Um, but it was fun and interesting, and that was the cool thing, right? Um, I really started loving Linux when I started using Ubuntu. Like, I used, uh, was it Jaunty Jackalope, I think? Uh, that was one of them, I believe, yeah. Uh, what version was that? Hang on, I'm, I'm using the almighty power of DuckDuckGo. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, uh... It was the codename for 904. No, it wasn't Johnny. It was before Johnny. It was in 2008 at some point. Um, he, it might have been Hardy. Yeah, or, Hardy uh, sounds right. In, Intrepid Ibex. I loved that one. Um, hang on. I'll, I'll send you a screenshot from the good old Wikimedia. Uh, there you go. That is my favorite version of Ubuntu. Uh, because when that version of yeah. Ubuntu came out, I had just graduated high school. Yeah. And, well, I had graduated prior, obviously, but, you know, it came out a couple months later, obviously. Um, and I, I love that wallpaper. Yeah. That coffee stain wallpaper. It's great. That's the one that I used. I remember that wallpaper. That's the one that I used. And uh, it was awesome. I loved that. I think I actually tried Intrepid Ibex on a, like, I tried to build my own little server, but I didn't have any experience with it at all. So... I installed like the desktop version of Ubuntu on it, and it, you know, nice. Yeah, it was. It was check fun. out, check out that other link. Yeah, yeah. Look at that old Nautilus. Yeah. Oof. Holy cow. Um, but I do have to say, uh, when I used the Ubuntu for the very first time, it was pretty hideous. Uh, I don't. Yeah. Like they got better in terms of look, but looking back at some of these old uh, releases here on Wikipedia. It's, it's mind-blowing to me because I loved, I mean, because I, you know, because I, I went, I, I basically graduated high school and then went straight to college. So that meant that I got a new computer that I had been, like, saving up for, and it was, like, night and day difference. It was, like, it was, like, going to, like, uh, uh, from, like, a DOS computer to, like, you know, a really high-end single core computer in like the mid 2000s like it, yeah. it was night and day difference um i mean because at that point i was still using like this 40 gig ide hard drive that was still actually working it didn't even have any dead sectors or anything which is pretty amazing um but it was slow 
it, it was it was just it was a horrible horrible experience like everything was terrible about that it was patched together uh, i actually did upgrade to like a sempron and stuff at, at like 2007 i was running like a sempron with you know this ati card which by the way back then ati was garbage complete garbage anyone who had an ati back then did not like it because fgrlx sucked and never worked half the time <laughs> yeah. um but i had to use uh what did, i had to use what did i have to use oh right i had to use uh windows for school so i actually bought two hard drives when i bought my new computer and one i had linux on and the other one i had windows vista and mm. that was my all through college experience was flipping back and forth and then when i finished college and started work and everything it was still dual boot but the machine kept getting better and better and now it's just pure linux because honestly you can do anything you want on linux now yeah nothing holding us, nothing holding us back anymore Nope, nothing holding us back. Oh, man. I remember, like, I was using Linux, like, almost full-time the year that Windows 7 came out. And I remember, like, upgrading. I had a Windows Vista PC, and I upgraded it to Windows 7, and I was like, well, this looks a lot nicer than Windows Vista. Time to wipe my hard drive and put Linux on it. <laughs> like... Oh my god! Yeah, it was that was. I remember that being like a moment for me, and I was like super duper excited about it. I was like, "This is gonna be awesome!" But if you guys have a comment or a question uh, you'd like to hear us answer on air, send me an email, uh, gardener at offtopical.net, or uh, drop your query in the show notes over on Patreon. Uh, they're available for everyone. The links for every episode, uh, for every topic we talked about today are also in the show notes, so check that out. Um, you can always catch the latest episode of this show at offtopical.net, or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel for more Linuxy goodness, uh, youtube.com slash the Linux Gamer. I want to thank Raven for being here with me today. Thank you, my friend. Always love being here. This is the Off Topical Podcast. My name's Gardner, and let's talk again soon.